Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Valerie Hope, and I am your coach. I'm also your host for this program, Time to Come Alive. It's an opportunity every week to have a meaningful conversation, an enlightening conversation with someone that will hopefully make you more conscious of yourself, what you value, more connected with other people. And also because of that, you become even more creative wherever you are in the world and with whomever you want to make an impact on. Every week I have the amazing opportunity and such a blessing to have really wonderful conversations with people who I admire, who I, who I really have learned so much from, and I hope that you have the same experience. And today is no exception. I can't wait to introduce her to you all. Um, and in just a moment, we'll do just that. For now, two things. I need for you all, if you're watching this live on live stream on Facebook, please share, make a comment. Let us know who you are and where you're, where you're watching this from, what part of the world you're in. Also, if you wanna share this on your own timeline, that way other people in your community or your circle get to see what you're up to and what you're listening to, you'll have some really wonderful conversations afterwards. Those of you who are joining us live on Zoom, in just a moment, we'll, have it, we'll, we'll start our conversation and then about halfway point, we'll open up the, the opportunity for you to actually ask a question or share any insights, but you also have the chat feature. So feel free to add any comments or questions as we go along then. So I'm excited to get you all in this. I'm sure that uh, today's gonna be a really nice treat for all of us. Now, before, as we always do every day, we have time to come alive. I'd like you just to take a moment to be mindful. And the way I like to do this is just make sure you're sitting comfortably wherever you are. If you're standing, make sure you're standing with your feet firmly planted in the ground. I want you to take a couple of deep cleansing breaths. And as you're breathing, why don't you just bring to mind, just kind of let it float up to your mind, you know, the, a person or a situation in which you've had doors opened to you. That could have been doors in a community, doors in the workplace, in, in a family. Just think about a situation where you've had doors opened for you. And specifically, the person or the people who contributed to that door being opened. So just think of that person or those individuals. Perhaps the door opening was a challenge that allowed you to go above and beyond. Perhaps that door opening was an opportunity for the person to say, hey, just step back a moment and wait. And then you had your grand entrance. Or, or perhaps there was just an opportunity to see just how much those individuals or that individual believed in you and your abilities and your capacity. So think of those individuals or that person or that group. And I invite you to right now, just in your mind, just say thank you in whatever way feels best to you. Now, if they're close by and they're somewhere present, you can get a hold of them. I actually invite you to go a step further and reach out, maybe write a note, a phone call, invite them out to lunch or coffee or, or tea and share how meaningful or how important it's been that they've opened those doors for you. All right, now that you have that person in mind, thank you so much for engaging in that exercise because that really leads us into this phenomenal human being that you're about to meet. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Patty Clapp. Obviously she's well known in the Dallas area and, and, and Patty will share a little bit more about herself shortly. But my experience with Patty started 19 years ago when I first moved to Dallas, Texas. And I moved here without a job, <laughs> literally starting fresh and had the, I don't know how this came about, but I know that spirit and, <laughs> and synchronicity was involved that I landed in Patty's office and had the opportunity to work for one of the most phenomenal bosses I've ever had. This is why I like to call this the series, my, my best bosses series, because I've had the opportunity to not only learn, you know, got into a professional environment, but one thing, Patty, I learned from you, and I don't know if I'd ever shared this from you, it was as simple as learning how to make coffee. 
<laughs> I remember my first few days, and we worked at the Dallas Regional Chamber. And the first few days, part of my role was to help prepare for any committee meetings and that sort of thing. And I knew nothing about making coffee or copies for that matter. I, was, I started off as an admin in your department. And what I loved about you is, and I still love about you, is your heart for service. You really went above and beyond and as well known and well connected as you were and as, as experienced as you were, you always found a way and opportunity to support not only us by doing the work, you didn't just request the work. <laughs> um, so that was a wonderful model for me. And the fact that you took so many chances over the years, you took a chance on me <laughs> when I came in, you gave me some wonderful opportunities. And then I just saw consistently in the years that we worked together, and mind you, we only worked three and a half years together, but it's left such a mark on me. And I'm, I'm sure that others who are on the call or listening to this will agree you, you've left such an impact on us personally on the community that you've served for so many years that i think this is just a wonderful time for us to honor you and then also get to know your secrets <laughs> so there we go so like even lucinda says she agrees lucinda was a co-worker at the time too so welcome to the show patty i'm excited to be here and to talk to you today it's really just a fun experience to get your phone call and say let me do this and i went how do you tell valerie no of course I'm <laughs> yes. have you ever done something like this before I have this is a first for me to be on a podcast live facebook something no, i love it this is the first time i'm honored I love, love it that you could walk me through my computer and get me to the point that I could do this with you. <laughs> I will say another thing that you, I really admire about you is just how, how willing you were, you were to get into the cutting edge of technology. You, were, you had a Blackberry before I had one. <laughs> I had a cell phone, I think. <laughs> so to this day, I think you're always much more willing and open than most of the leaders that I've worked with. What, what has you be that way? has me be open to that. Yeah. I mean, I may have to go back to when I look at my background and my career. Um, went to college in the University of Oklahoma, got a degree in English with a te teaching certificate, which at that time was kind of one of the two things in 1965 you were going to do as a woman. You were going to teach or be a nurse, basically. Um, got married the next year, came to Dallas. Uh, about a year and a half in Dallas ISD. Uh, that's an interesting hiring story because when I went to, inter I had done my student teaching in Oklahoma City at a high school, uh, or at Norman at a high school. I had done my teaching in Oklahoma City at a high school. When I came to Dallas, uh, it was kind of late in the season and Eng English teachers are hard to find. But the Dallas ISD had some openings and I went and I actually interviewed with their assistant superintendent for human resources asking for a high school position and he looked at me and he said patty you are too young and too short to teach in a high school but if you would like a junior high job i have one for you now that was 1966 i know everybody's going what this is 1966 if it had been a few years later i'd be a rich woman right right now and i'd be <laughs> a pod podcast or what have you but it wasn't and my husband was starting to law school, so I took the junior high teaching job, um, which I taught until I then stayed home to have my family. Uh, during that time period, did all kinds of volunteer work, got to know people in the community. I think got to understand people in the community, what they were looking for, how projects were successful, how when a volunteer group wanted to do something, what the people needed to put into it, how you needed to interact with, with elected officials, with people in the community that could help you make a difference. Um, then I stayed, stayed home all that time. Ninth grade, I decided that was probably um, long enough to stay home. And I interviewed for my first job at that point. Um, and I interviewed with a man who was then vice president of the Dallas Chamber of Commerce. Uh, wasn't the Dallas Regional Chamber, then it was the Dallas Chamber, and he looked at my resume, okay, didn't talk to me first, just looked at my resume, and his words to me were, well, I don't see anything on here that says you've had a paying job 
in the last 14 years. Well, I hadn't, yeah. but I had chaired five major organizations in Dallas. I had been elected to the Richardson School Board. I had served the president of the Richardson School Board. I had served, I had been elected to the Texas Association of School Boards for the statewide. And I wasn't really, didn't have to have a job. So I just looked at him and said, well, if you can't see value in everything that I have done, and you can find anyone else that has been the lead to manage multi-million dollar organizations, who has had to hire and fire a CEO, and has had to oversee X number of people, I said, I wish you luck in finding me. And I left. <laughs> I just walked out, called my husband and went, well, that's not really the job for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually to run the Leadership Dallas program at the Chamber, which I had been through four years prior to that. Anyway, went home, we went on vacation. I just thought we're gonna come back, I'm gonna put my network out, see what opportunities might be there. And there was a phone call from this person. And he said, I think maybe we got off on the wrong foot. Would you come back and talk to me again? Mm. I was a little hesitant to do it, to be honest with you, uh, but I went back. Uh, in the time I had been gone, he had actually talked to some people who had worked with me in the volunteer arena and decided that maybe this focusing on lack of a real paycheck was not the key. Mm -hmm. So he offered me a job and I started the chamber. Yes. How did that experience, Patty, inform you in leading people? Because clearly you were doing a lot of leadership anyway, but like you said, or like he acknowledged that you hadn't received a paycheck in exchange for the leadership of the the work that you did. So how, what did you get out of that experience that informed your style? I think what I got out of it, and I actually thought, really feel like I probably already knew it, but it just really hit me between the eyes was, when you're looking for someone to work with you, that piece of paper tells you some things, but it doesn't tell you everything about a person. You need to be able to talk to that person, you need to be able to understand them, you need for them to understand what your goals are, and you need to understand what their goals are. And before the podcast, you were laughing about making coffee, copies and fixing coffee. And literally, when I was looking for people at the chamber, I needed to have people for whatever level I was hiring them in, understood they might need to make coffee or they might need to make copies. But that position, just because you had a director title or a manager title or a vice president title, that didn't put you above doing everything that needed to be done to get that benefit. And I wanted, talking to people, I wanted to feel they understood that. That yes, the policy part of the job was important, but the interactions, whatever it took to make that meeting look perfect, or to make that luncheon look perfect, or to make that conversation about the policy all it could be, it needed to be the person all involved in it. And, you know, there, there were times when I'd interview someone that I could tell that making coffee was going to raise their eyebrows and it wouldn't have worked for them. You know, they wanted to know who was going to make the coffee. <laughs> and we looked at them and went, well, some days it may be you. And it was not comfortable with them. I knew that wasn't somebody that I wanted as part of our team. I, because our team needed to be flexible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we had workforce, we had education, we had leadership at that time. So people needed to interact across teams and they, they needed to be willing, I love the coffee comment, but they needed to make, be willing to make coffee for the other person's program because that was important to have that job done with. Um, so. Yeah, you actually made it fun, I'd have to admit. And secretly, I never said this to you, but I was a little bit like, I have to make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Primarily because, you know, I'd just come from traveling all over the world. I'd work, you know, with up with people for so many years. And I'm like, I'm, I might, I'm like, I have a college degree. And I, so my head was actually quite inflated at that point in my life. But I will say that even that was not how we led the conversation around wow. making coffee. But I, I was just so taken with one, not only the conversation I had with you, because you do see beyond the paper. And I thought that was something that was really, that, that honored the people that were coming in. But you also had me, and I've seen this happen even when I was working with you, had all of us speak to the other team members. 
So the other team members essentially got a say in who you brought in. So tell me, why did you decide to go that way? How, how did that impact who you hired? Well, I think part of it probably goes back to my volunteer work for all those years that I had, I really learned how important that networking was, the communication was, and between in a volunteer organization, everyone needs to understand everybody's role. Uh, it's not, they're not getting paid for it. And it, they know it'll work better if they're communicating and they're helping each other, even though I'm in charge of raffle tickets or I'm in charge of XYZ. And I think I just carried that over to the work at the chamber that I felt like our department, the people in our department, from the administrative assistants to the managers to the, to the directors, all needed to understand who we were as a department and that we weren't one person standing alone. We weren't education over here or workforce over here. That we were a total department and that it was all important how we interacted with each other. And, and that brings me to one of the most important things I thought working in a chamber was. And I kind of, I tried to convey that. I think due to the staff and when I was hiring them, a, a membership organization doesn't exist unless it has members. And if you don't learn early on that that communication with those people outside the staff of your organization is important, you're not going to be successful because they're the ones that bring the credibility. They're the ones that bring that outside influence. They're the ones that can help you make your organization, your project successful. So you have to value those people. You can't look at them as intruders. Now, I have to admit, there were some days when I was busy working and I had volunteers calling me about something and I'm going, I just don't want to answer that phone. But that, I mean, they were the reason we existed and they were the reason we could be successful. So understanding the importance of that communication outside of our network was really crucial to me. And I, I needed to know that I was having staff who could value those people. I learned a lot about service, customer service, even through through my experiences with you. I, I want to go back to something, and you know, you said you graduated from college in 1965, and most of the people that I recall, at least in our group, you given opportunities to maybe right out of college in some of in some of our cases. I had a very little work experience. Um, can you contrast what you did for our group and our generation? compared to what your experience was just out of college and, and opportunities in the workforce for women? Well, well, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, I think 1965, uh, really 1966, as a woman, uh, I'm, there were people that did other things, but the most, two, well, two employment opportunities where you go to teaching or you go to nursing. They're really going into corporate headquarters and applying for a job wasn't, very re real at that time. Now, if I'd gone on to law school, maybe that would have opened up some more doors, but graduating with a graduate degree there. When you all came in, you all had so many opportunities in the world. I mean, you're up with people experience and where some of the other people who'd been a few years out of college had been. Uh, that was just marvelous to me. But the ones that we hired that were just out of college, I wanted them to have an opportunity to experience our community. Because I felt like if they could understand that and come to the chamber, then that opened up other paths for them. Now, I didn't realize how soon it might open up other paths for some. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I knew that that would give them a good foundation for future. That having come to a chamber of commerce, being willing to work that range of jobs that come under the responsibility or not under the responsibility, but working that job to make that program successful and working to make certain that our volunteers felt welcomed, felt appreciated, those kind of skill sets, they're not, I can do Mac 103 or whatever technology term would be, but they're skill sets that are people skill sets that I felt it was important for each of my staff to learn. I felt that those people skill sets would give them the foundation long term in their career, more so than if I made sure they all knew how to do Excel and do Excel anymore. But more so than if I, they learned the technical part of a computer sitting in front of them, I felt that the, how to understand the community 
how to look at issues from the broad community. And that, that was one of the things that I kind of, I don't know, I can't tell you my gut, how I knew it, but in talking with people I interviewed, that was one of the things that I took away from my conversations was that they would feel comfortable trying to understand the community beyond them. Mm. Uh, and that we would be working with the community beyond what was in their network. I mean, I wouldn't embarrass her and say her name, but I heard one young woman who actually graduated, you all know who she is, who are my friends, from the other university in Oklahoma. <laughs> and I told her uh, that I really, you know, paper resumes I looked at, but I didn't really pay that much attention to. But I said, you're a, your other university graduate almost made me say, do I really want one of these people on this team? No. Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, that so for, for, for the context, because there are some people who may be watching that don't understand what you mean. Can you explain what this other university okay. relationship I'm, is? I'm a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. And as in Texas, when you say the University of Oklahoma, you talk about the one in Norman. Well, there is one in Stillwater, Oklahoma, called Oklahoma State. And they are intense uh, in-state rivals. Uh, and so, you know, we laugh and go, nobody from o OU would ever hire an OSU graduate. <laughs> Just, just well, well, that just goes to show how committed you were to being, <laughs> to really, to really giving people opportunities and looking beyond the paper. I really, that's really excellent. <laughs> um, I, I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk about some of the things that you've done. Because one, beyond just empowering this young group of people and and giving us these opportunities, opening doors for us, and giving these experiences. You've also been really passionate about policy and passionate about the community. Where can you tell us where what's driving that passion? You know, I think I have had that feel for the community as long as I can remember. Um, even in high school, in college, I was very involved. I was on our uh, student affairs council. I was on our university activities board, which did all kinds of things. I was on our university state, our university senate, which worked with the administration on policy for the colleges. So I think I've had that. When we came to Dallas uh, for my husband to start law school, we really only knew a few people. And one of the ways to get involved and to meet people was to start volunteering in areas where I had an interest. And one of those areas was politics. And it's probably not appropriate to say, but I became very involved in one of the parties, became a precinct chair, um, spent about eight years of my life on a volunteer basis uh, working for uh, the county party chair on a day, no pay, 40 hours a week, recruiting and training people to be precinct chairs in Dallas County. And through that, I got to know elected officials. I got really to understand how to make a difference in public policy and that Again, it was people reaching out to people, understanding people, getting to know people. So I got to know the elected officials in Dallas County. Um, I was passionate about education. And at one point in that time period where I was still a volunteer, uh, one of our longtime school board members in Richardson said he was retiring. And we were looking for a new person to run for school board, had a group of people over at my house, and they're all kind of looking at each other. And I think my husband said to me, why not you? So I ran for school board. Uh, that was interesting. At that point, I knew like Highlands. I knew Dallas because of volunteer activities. Really didn't know Richardson so much. Uh, and the city of Dallas is the majority of the Richardson School District, but a significant number of voters, obviously, in Richardson. Um, so I got to reach out to that community. Uh, first time I ran, I ran against seven other people. I had like 98% of the vote. Right, and had to have over, you had to have, no, I had 49.9% of it. I had to have over 50 to win without a runner, so I had to go through a round. All my opponents endorsed me, except the guy I ended up running against. And I won with a little over 59%. That taught me that getting voters out to vote was so important and working with your community because all these friends that had voted for me the first time thought, because I was so close, it wasn't necessarily that I vote the second time. So, uh, you know, that's something I'm still involved in in neighborhoods is encouraging people to vote. Look at the candidates. Don't 
do with the party tours, you look at the candidates, see who's there, get to know them and understand them, and vote because one, two, three, five votes to make a difference. Um, got involved in that, passionate about education, so stay involved with that for a number of years, got to be involved at the state level. That took me into the legislative arena. Uh, so for, I guess, three, four sessions, I was actually the face of the state association school board's legislative work. So again, got to know more elected officials, got to understand more about policy, got to know who I could talk to and trust and respect what they were saying, and got to know who I could talk to and they would tell me what I wanted to hear, but they wouldn't pay any attention to it later on. Um, which served me well then when I was vice president of the chamber, eventually in government affairs was one of my areas because I had that, that volunteer background in there. Uh, so education, passion, took me to policy, passion, uh, which took me, you know, to, to help at the chamber. And that, going back to the hiring question, that's what I wanted to see in people, is people who could learn about something and develop a passion for something that may not seem exciting, but when you look at how it impacts the community and people in the community, it is exciting. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, obviously passion plays a role in so many of the things that you say yes to. Where does that passion come from? Because you've not stopped. <laughs> I mean, you've been retired now eight years, you said. Yeah. Right. So you've been retired eight years. You clearly still passionate, even in your tone of voice and your, and your facial expressions, you can you convey that very clearly. Where does that passion for those things come from? What's the root? Uh, you know, if I really go back, and I don't say this very often, but I grew up in a very dysfunctional household growing up. Uh, and there were times we needed things, times that things didn't go as smoothly as they should, should. And I saw community being friends, families being able to help us. Um, I had people that helped me get my scholarships and grants and work grants to go to college. And I just saw how that people reaching out can make a difference in someone's life. Uh, and I thought, okay, that I was helped back then because when I started, started college, there was no money in the bank account for that. There was no way I was going to pay for four years at OU. And people from administrative people at OU that helped me find more grants and helped me find more scholarships and people that helped me find scholarships. Um, and checked on me while I was at OU to make sure, you know, that I had that money to do what it was I needed to buy the bread the next week or whatever. I just saw how much that reaching out and helped help people. And I think that was just, I feel that. I mean, I felt it in my job at the chamber and I felt fortunate at the chamber coming from a career of volunteer work that I went into an organization that my husband laughed one day and said it lets you continue volunteering your passion, but they didn't look at me. Um, you know, so it was not a big gap for me to go from no paycheck in a number of years to being a paid employee, but working with the community and doing things that were helping our community. And I, and I still feel that way. I mean, I look at the neighborhood in like Highlands, which has changed dramatically in diversity since we moved out here. And I look at the number of organizations that have come up that are helping kids who need help in this community. Uh, we have a group called 100 Women of Black Highlands that sprung up and you know, they just donate some money and they pick projects beyond the schools. Um, like the Machine Women's League this year gave backpacks to students at Black Highlands High School. They're seeing need in our community, which maybe across Dallas, people don't look at like Highlands and see a need, but our community sees it. I see all mm -hmm. people that have that passion to make certain if you live in our community and help them. And I, it's, I just feel it still. Yeah. Well, it sounds like for you, because because of your upbringing, there were so many gaps to fill that the community really were, were, was the was the impetus for so yeah. many of your, of your success. So much of your success I mean, came it, from yeah. what the community created for you. Yeah, I mean, I think it really did. It was... Mm -hmm knowing that if I had the desire to do something and that I was confident to do it, that there were going to be, people were going to reach out and help me. Mm. And like hiring people just out of college or working with some of the volunteer projects, it's that reaching out 
to help somebody move forward that I think is just very important to me. Absolutely. And it made such an impact. It really does. And I think we take for granted sometimes that these community organizations or these volunteer opportunities are exactly what's needed to keep society as society moving yeah. forward. Yeah. And you, much like my mother, I think you've met my mother, right? Yes, she's out. Um, yes. Yeah. But she also has a heart for advocacy, community, community advocacy. And, and yeah, she taught me how the importance of volunteer work made such an impact on me growing up and, and being able to see that I could fulfill a need in different ways. I've never quite been drawn to politics as you have, but I think all of us have a, a, a piece, right? So I think what I'm getting from your conversation right now is to really look at where it is that you feel you can make the greatest impact, right? Wherever your, your heart, the doors have been opened for you and you know that you can open the doors for others, do so. And I, I'll actually say that you helped me with this because about a year ago, I went to an event and in the, it, just overhearing a conversation about someone saying, oh, I wish I'd had mentors when I was in high school. This is from a you know, grown woman, professional woman. And I, just overhearing that, I thought, you know, I've been mentored so much. I've had so many wonderful conversations and opportunities you know, through leaders like you. I've not actually done that intentionally. I think if somebody comes and asks me a question, you know, I might guide them. But because of that conversation, I remember coming to you and saying, you know what, Patty, I feel like I need to connect with some youth, some youth and offer, especially those that haven't had maybe the opportunities or the exposure or the families, et cetera. And you connected me with Victory Meadow Foundation. And now I'm a, I've been a mentor for a year with the Eagle Scholars, which is a group of students that are from refugee families in many cases. And they're preparing for college and it's meant so much. So I can absolutely see what you're saying about, you know, really finding an opportunity to contribute whatever gift you have to right. your community and some right. of that obvious a gift you have because Janet Morris who is in that program. Yeah. Tells me more often than, I mean, I see her and she mentions your name and how excited she is that you're volunteering and the difference you've made for this group. But I think what you just said is true. It's finding that area where you can be passionate and you have the skills and the competency to help. I mean, I know over the years, I accepted positions on a couple of boards and three months later, I went, okay, I am dreading going to this board meeting. I'm not comfortable with, you know, yes, they're doing good work, but this isn't me. Uh, so I, one of the things that I did learn and I do recommend is when you're asked, and once you get on a board, obviously for community volunteers, you're asked and you're asked. Mm -hmm. and is to step back, not just because your best friend's asking you or your neighbor's asking, but does that board really, really have a passion mm. for what you want to do and where you want to make a difference? Because if not, you're just going to be a body in attendance and you're not really going to be helping them. Um, you're very purpose-driven. I, I so admire that. I want to just take a moment and let those know who are here with us live and watching if you have comments or questions for patty you can put them in the chat or if you're comfortable and want to actually speak them i uh, would love for you to unmute yourself and just let me know that you're interested in saying a few words because i i want to first of all i want to know patty i want you to know that you know there are people here who are listening to your every word <laughs> um actually if i if i if you don't mind i'm, I'm going to invite one of them in particular who we spoke to earlier to to say a few words Lucinda, hi. To unmute yourself. There we go. Hi. 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 Lucinda, can you just tell us who you are, where you're coming from, where you're calling from, and then also what what are you getting from this conversation with Patty today? Well, I'm Lucinda Summerlin, and I worked for Patty for almost three and a half years. Um, and I just and you were such a such an important mentor to me. Um, and I have the coffee story. I have my version of the coffee story, getting the coffee, like I, my first leadership Dallas. I just, I appreciate the service. Like you were like, we're the, we're in charge, but we're also, we need to serve the, the volunteers as well. I had that, I have a similar story to yours, uh, Valerie. Mm -hmm. And I just, it re really made an impact on me. Um, I was only there for three and a half years, but I learned so much. And I just appreciate, I don't even think I knew where you were coming from, Patty, and what that interview at the chain, you know, your first interview. Um, that's really eye-opening to see 
how intentional and how you really did open up for us because my resume didn't show that I should be um, working for the chamber and it, it made such an impact on me. And so I appreciate that. You were wonderful. Miss seeing you though. I miss seeing you guys. That's why I decided to turn my camera on. So I can <laughs> Smile at you guys. Oh, we're so glad. And Lucinda, you and I, we did work for about three and a half years together. That was also the amount of time that I spent in the chamber. And, and you know, Patty, you created, you create, like, Patty has a tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Patty has a squad. <laughs> we have a squad. We did. Yeah, and we still do. I mean, it's been 20 years virtually for most of us. And at least in this little, in our little group, but I'm sure that there's so many others, Patty, that you've influenced. But we literally, we, I remember for a while we even had like little little reunions, like a, like alumni almost. <laughs> Patty's Patty's alumni. <laughs> yes, that's it, right. Wow, the fact that you created that environment for us, Patty. I mean, it's such a testament and such a legacy. Now I know you have a couple daughters and a son, so I'm curious about where you see or what you've taught your children about the workforce and how you've opened, perhaps opened doors for them or, or asking them to seek opportunities like the ones that you provided for us. How, how do you do that as a mother? Well, you know, I think I, what my daughters and son would say, but I think part of it is just modeling it. I mean, they see what you're doing. I mean, my youngest daughter grew up not playing house, except playing meeting. You know, playing meeting. Playing meeting. <laughs> would go somewhere, she would have a piece of paper and a pencil in her hand, you know, because we were going to another meeting. Um, and so I think it's that modeling. And, and I feel, I brag on my children, feel very proud. My oldest daughter uh, works for uh, Young Life, which is a national organization for youth. And uh, she just recently was asked to head their national program for middle school youth. So she is traveling around the country. She is teaching people how to mentor junior high kids, how to work with them, how to bring them to their church. And it doesn't matter what church it is, but bring them so that they have some relationship. Uh, and she's teaching other people how to do that. She's speaking to the junior high kids. Uh, she volunteers in Lake Highlands for that program herself. So, I mean, her whole life has been given back to the community. My mm -hmm. other daughter, my youngest, started out um, volunteering for the same group uh, and then got married, has four kids, left me and moved to New York City. Thank you, Brad. Um, <laughs> and uh, she is involved in every, I mean, New York City didn't know anything. One of her first experiences was going to the high school where her son had been admitted and walked up and I guess by email had volunteered to hand out cookies or greet parents or something. Principal walked up to him, her to introduce himself, and he said, oh, you must be that mom from Texas because you're volunteering. Uh, <laughs> it was wow. Miracle, you know. But uh, so she stayed. I mean, she's involved in the church up there. She's involved. She's got three different schools. She's involved in volunteering. Um, they've got some other programs they're involved in. So that's, that's an important part of their life, giving back. My son, who is a professor of ancient languages, Greek and Latin at Samford University in Birmingham, actually met his wife uh, volunteering uh, in inner city Birmingham through some youth programs and they were both volunteering there. He was a professor and she was a student at the time, um, but after she graduated, um, they decided they could be serious and married and have two beautiful kids in Birmingham area, but they volunteer like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in the family. I don't know that I taught it. If anything, I would say, as I said, I would, it was modeling that it was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think all three of them would tell you it's the way they feel after they've given back to the community, after they've done something. They're not doing it for a paycheck or for accolades. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because it feels right to them to do it yeah. and give back. And they know that, you know, if you, if there aren't those, they're going to get back to the community. So that's one of the things I, at the chamber, I, I thought it was so wonderful that we could reach out and work with so many different companies, different groups, uh, that they could see us as an organization really trying to make a difference in the community. One thing that I think Lucinda said maybe earlier in that, um, 
the one thing I didn't want to do when I was hiring you all, I wasn't hiring you for me to do your job. Because mm -hmm. if I needed to do your job, then why did I hire you? Mm -hmm. I mean, did I need to do five jobs, studying the workforce, education, leadership, et cetera? Or did I need to find people that I trust you to do those jobs? And that's mm -hmm. the way I tried to hire and tried to have the boss, if that's a word, um, that I hired you because I had confidence in you. I felt that you could do what we hired you to do, whether or not your resume said you'd ever run a leadership program or that you'd ever been in the workforce development. That, as I said, that type of thing wasn't really where I was looking. But I wanted to feel that you could take the reins of that job and do it. And I wasn't that I wouldn't have to do my job anymore because that's not the problem. Yeah, you gave us a lot of a lot of space to create and you challenged us. You also gave us ideas. But yeah, and Lucinda, you know, well, Lucinda, you might want to share that comment out loud because I think that that's still telling of the impact that, that Patty had on us. Right. You didn't, you didn't micromanage me and I, you let me, you, 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 you provided an example, but you, and you kind of, you would kind of point me in the right direction, but then you would let me go. And it really made me step up um, and do more than, than I thought I could do. Um, and I appreciated that and, and took that with me to my next job. I really want, that's the kind of, um, I was hired to be a boss and I wanted, that's the kind of, um, boss is not the right word. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to be that. I wanted, that's what I wanted to do was, um, not micromanage my team. And I really appreciated that example from you. That was huge. Thank you for sharing that. Really? Lucinda. And I will say actually that the impact that you had Patty in modeling that because I came in, I don't know, Lucinda, you were there maybe a, a year or two before I got there, I think. Right. Maybe not even that. Yeah. Yeah. But you modeled that with me. You know, I did. It felt like the, yeah. <laughs> well, granted, all of us had our own responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I also felt really empowered by the rest of the team. I know anytime I came to you, Lucinda, you'd have some guidance for me or you'd give me some advice or, but that no one was, even the more experienced, the, the more experienced staff members weren't micromanaging or telling, okay, do this, then do that, look, check back with us. And mm -hmm. so Patty, I think what you modeled and created was a team that definitely collaborated, but also could inspire and empower the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you, because of that, I think all of us took on that role. We were like mini Patties by the time we got <laughs> out of there. <laughs> well, it was just like with your children, you, you know, you modeled it and then we, we just, we learned from that. Um, it was very, yeah. it was very subtle. I yeah. don't think it, it was very, um, I don't think I realized what, how you were doing it. And it was, and then when I tried to do it, it was a lot harder. <laughs> you made it look. All in the environment. All <laughs> in, um, thank you so much for that, Lucinda. Patty, I, that means a lot to me. I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, there are times as a leader in your organization, it is much easier to say, this has got to get done and I'm going to do it. It's just, you know, I know that I can do this today in this many hours. And if I let somebody else do it, we may have to redo it. It may take longer. So it's easier to fear to the other side. But that wasn't what I wanted because I wanted people, as I said, who would take responsibility, who would do it, who would come up with creative ideas that I couldn't come up with. Mm. Uh, that they would be able to look beyond what that job description said and look beyond what the project was and be able to be creative and have it. And that, that was really important. And y'all did that. So. Yeah, you did good in hiring us, but nothing, not, not to take away from that intention, but you were also way too busy. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, really, like, is Patty here today? <laughs> or we had, a, we had our moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> like yeah, I'll, I'll go on. I'll be back later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to shift gears a little bit as, as we we're coming towards the, the end of this conversation. But, you know, we talked about your kids and how you modeled for them as a mother, what it looks like to be involved and to have that commitment and advocacy to the community. Uh, but you also grew up in an era where most women, like you said, only had a couple of options as far as career, but were expected to marry and, 
you know, and then pretty much just be a, a you know, wife and mother. And so I want to turn now to your relationship with your husband, Roger, because I'm sure, <laughs> you know, at that point in time, he probably had some ideas about what a relationship would look like. So I'm curious about how you found a man that supported you or, or talk, talk to us a little bit about how you found a partner to support you in all the things that you've been able to do and become and what that, what impact that's had on you. I mean, I would say just bless of luck. Uh, I mean, Roger has been so supportive over the years. He could have run for school board when we were looking for a school board candidate. Um, and he's been willing to be financially supportive for my efforts to, you know, listen to me, gripe, complain, uh, talk about something that's going on, uh, go with me to all kinds of things, um, and just be there for me. And it's, I mean, I could not have done the volunteer stuff I've done. I couldn't have done the job at the chamber if I hadn't had that support. And, you know, and he was a patent and trademark attorney. He just retired last year. Um, and so he had a busy schedule uh, with his clients, et cetera. Uh, but he was just very willing to be there for me and to support me. And uh, he would love me to tell this when you say met somebody. We were down at OU before our freshman year started. We were in the financial aid office and he was checking on his scholarships. Uh, and I was checking on my financial aid package and we walked out of the bursar's office and he's with a friend from Oklahoma City and we start talking. Roger and me, Joel, his friend. And we are talking about people we knew in common from Oklahoma City because Roger was in speech and debate and I was referencing my good friends from my high school that were in speech and debate. So we had this conversation and we walk away. And Roger tells this story that Joel looked at him and said, do you know who that was? And Roger said, no, I thought you, you knew who that was. So anyway, that was our introduction. I that in ninth grade, we went to a dance class together because one of my friends from my high school went to his church and she had a crush on him and went to the dance class and I met him at that dance class and he claims not to remember me. So mm. my first impression was nothing. <laughs> well, at that age. <laughs> we actually started dating uh, as a chance. Our sorority fraternity had date night and they matched the freshman up blind dates. Mm. We had ah, and that's where it all started, the tour de fair. Tour de fair at that point, not not so much the bursar's office. I knew who I was talking to, he just didn't. <laughs> he didn't know what he was in for by talking to me there. Yeah. yeah. So so I'm curious, what advice then would you give women, especially because I think even today, although things have changed considerably in, in really finding a partner to support career, but in some ways it, there's some things that haven't changed. So what advice do you give to women to finding the kind of partnership that you have with Roger to nurture that over so many years? Because you've been married now for how long? 53. 53 years. Woo! So wow. tell us a little bit. We want some of that motherly wisdom right now, Patty. What, what is it? What, is, what does it take? I mean, I think the main thing, I mean, anyone would say this communication, uh, valuing your partner, valuing understanding them, valuing their willing, willingness to support you and what they're having to give up in that willingness to support you. Um, because there were times when I was in the school board, Roger had to be the parent at the teacher conference because having a school board member walk into that teacher's classroom was not, there'll be eyebrows raised. You couldn't just be a mother, you were the school board member. Uh, so he had to take, you know, he had to be more on those responsibilities when traveling out of town, be willing, you know, to be there for the kids and take up that responsibility along with his law practice. So it's just that communication, that understanding, that valuing what each are doing and understanding what each are doing. Uh, you know, there, there aren't times when he says, okay, don't you think you've done enough? Uh, like I am completing my 12 year, well, completing my six year term on the Texas Board of Nursing. And they asked me if I would apply for the governor to reappoint me. And my husband said, over my dead body. <laughs> I got that message. <laughs> I did not apply to be reappointed to the Board of Nursing. 
mainly because as an appointed board member in Texas, even though you make no salary, you have to turn in the same financial data that elected officials do. So it is a huge project to complete financial data for him. You have to, and he does it. When you talk about support, the 12 years I was been on that board and the 14 years I was on the Trinity River Authority where I had to do it, he's done all that background work for me. Mm. And then he said, I'm done doing those financial <laughs> forms. So I would recommend you not apply again. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to do the financial forms, so that ended that. No, problem. that took care of that. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just, you know, listening and valuing that. And no, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's, I'm done. But I was just going to say the thing I value also about the relationship that you all have is you really keep it fresh in many ways that there's so many times that you've shared or even when I see postings where you're traveling together and you're doing all these different activities. So can you talk, tell us a little bit about the, the fun times when, when he's not filling out financial paperwork for you. <laughs> what, how do you all connect? Oh, I mean, we, we do a lot of traveling. Uh, of course, with grandkids in Birmingham and New York City now, that's a lot of traveling. Um, my sister is a wonderful hostess and has a condo in San Francisco, which is our favorite city to travel to. And we'll go out in San Francisco and we go out all the time. We used to go out because American Airlines had a $79 round trip on the weekend fair. Um, but we'll go out now and someone said, well, you go to San Francisco Metro, what do you do? Well, we, we sit, we enjoy the view, we take walks. Uh, we love going to Nova Scotia, which we've done multiple times to Cape Britain to the music festival. Uh, our families are, well, all but my son's family are Disney World fanatics, Disneyland fanatics. <laughs> So we have taken, we just got back right before Labor Day. We were in Florida as the hurricane was approaching at Disney World. So we, last, last December, uh, my son and son-in-law did all the plans and we went to Italy with all 13 of us from before Christmas to New Year's. Stayed in a wonderful uh, walled town of Crotona in a place that my son found that was just perfect. Uh, so, and we love traveling. We love, we love the symphony. We go to the symphony on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we do things in the neighborhood. We just, you know, and the days we want to sleep till 10 o'clock when someone's not asking me to be on my computer at 8 <laughs> We will sleep, you know. I'm sure all of us appreciate the sacrifice you're making right yeah. now <laughs> to be up early. <laughs> yeah, have but that's before 8.15. <laughs> and, and then we also go to, uh, Ewing Finley Exercise Facility. Roger goes to a cancer care program twice a week where he exercises and I go in the pool and then I go over once a week and exercise. And so we go over there and do that. So yeah, I mean, what I, I you hear people say this and I think I, I, I truly mean it. I don't know how to work mm -hmm. because I don't know how to have the time to do that because we, we take advantage of our time now. I mean, we figure as long as we can travel, we ought to travel. Mm -hmm. As long as we can see things we haven't seen. We went to Ireland in March, been on my bucket list. Went with a couple of Irish singers who were on our bus the whole time. We were wonderful. Um, so we just, you know, we look at things that we want to do and we're lucky enough to be in the position mm -hmm. that we can do those. And we can do them together. Now, I did tell you, I take girl trips. He's, he, he puts up with that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're just kind of doing what we want to do. And That's lovely. Where we want to be involved. And he's involved with OU with me. And goes to all my meetings up there with me. And so You're like a full package, Patty, really, from just <laughs> the commensurate leader, but also just the, the consummate leader, the that. The, the, the community advocate, you know, the mother, the caring mother, the, the nurturing wife. I mean, like all of it. So yes. as, I'm, I'm perfect. Just ask me. That. <laughs> you can ask a lot of people and you would not get it. I didn't say that. <laughs> so you're close. You're so close. But I'm curious about, so now, you know, at, 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 when it all said and done, this generation of women who are currently in the workforce or moving into the ranks, what advice would you provide for, for them? What piece of wisdom, knowing what, what we're walking into at this point in time in history? Think, in history? You know, one of the phrases you keep hearing, and, and 
I wonder about a lot is the women trying to do it all. And I'm not quite sure what that means to me, um, but I think they have to step back and know they can be a mother, they can have a career, they can be a good wife. They just have to look at, make sure they know how it all fits together. They have to have that communication to make sure it all fits together. Um, and they have to be willing to be comfortable themselves with what they're doing. They can't, they can't just say, okay, I know I'm on the career track to be partner at this law firm and push all this other stuff aside. There has to be a balance in their life and they have to be willing to say, what's that balance and how am I going to look at it? Uh, and what am I going to lose if I don't have that balance? Um, so I think it's harder today for women to have that perspective and have that balance because there's more expectation of them on their careers than there was back when. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that career expectation really makes it hard to look at that balance that you need to have. But, but whatever directions you head with that, you just have to be comfortable with yourself. You have to know that this is, this is what I want. And you have, if you're married, you have to be communicative with your spouse on that and make sure there's a respect on both sides for whatever the family game plan is. Mm -hmm. You just can't go walking down the woods by yourself. Well said. Wow. Patty, thank you so, so much. I, like I said in the beginning, I just, I admire you so much. I think the, the level of not only the professional Patty, but, but your heart. I think that you really, you're one of those leaders who definitely led with heart. You know, you're sharp as a tack for sure. You didn't let many things by, but the fact that you gave so many of us opportunities to learn and grow with you, opportunities for us to learn and grow elsewhere, right? You were also such a great advocate for us to, for those young women and, and men who work with you to, to move on and up. And also, I think what you're doing for the community can't be understated. That's, that's really where you've invested so much of your time and energy and just creating this wonderful place to live, right? And not only the local level, the state level, um, and, and beyond. So I want to just acknowledge you for all the things that you've brought to all of us and the impact that you've had and the things that we never saw or heard that it took for you <laughs> in order to make that possible. We probably don't know the half of it, but thank you so much for sharing yourself with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I felt very honored and this was really fun to do. So thanks, Valerie. That was fun for me too. Now you have to share this with your kids and everyone. You know, this will be an opportunity to see grandma in yeah. action. <laughs> yes. Live streaming. <laughs> to make the equipment work to do it but my 18 year old son will be grandson will be proud of me so you absolutely will <laughs> and then uh, the others any of you who are listening to this live or recorded please and you have questions or comments about patty's life or what she shared or any insights from what she shared please do put them in the comments below and you know, let patty know what you thought of what she shared any wisdom of your own that you'd like to share as well would be super helpful so thank you all for being here. And those of you who are live, Lucinda, thank you again also for your comments and, and for, for going the extra mile to, to, to be camera ready today. <laughs> That's phenomenal. I'm so excited. Now next week, for those of you who like to tune in on a regular basis, next Tuesday, we also have a wonderful conversation. We're going to be talking to Rebecca Jowers and she has committed her part of her life and her energy and her passion around protecting and serving victims of human trafficking, which is something that has been talked about quite a lot. And it, it's deep, it's really deep. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what drives her and how she balances all other things in her life to, to help that particular community and that cause. So, so tune in next Tuesday, same time, same place. Looking forward to that. Thank you all so much again for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.